You're watching the National News Desk, America's News Now. From the nation's capital, this is the National News Desk, America's News Now. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dee Dee Catton. And on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and we look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four areas we've been tracking in the aftermath of Helene and Milton. In western North Carolina, it's been two weeks since Helene battered mountain communities. Many are still without water internet and power. In Georgia, the governor has extended a state of emergency for several counties slammed by Helene. The damage there estimated at six and a half billion dollars. On Florida's west coast, cities like Tampa and Sarasota dealing with the aftermath of flooding. And on the east coast of Florida, dozens of tornadoes wreaked havoc on homes and businesses. Tornadoes tore through central Palm Beach County ahead of Milton and the village of Wellington was hit particularly hard. Victoria de Cardenas from our station in South Florida spoke with one mom who was putting up her hurricane shutters when she saw the tornado coming straight at her. I was outside when the tornado was coming. I was actually back there shuddering. So that's where my son and I were when it happened and I ran in through this and she, my best friend, was sitting right here where the impaled glass on the wall is. Wellington mom Megan Shirley is still trying to come to grips with how close her and her family came to dying when a tornado tore through her home at the corner of Edgefield Road and Meadowwood Drive. The damage to her house is obvious from down the block, but the destruction inside is worse. So be careful. There's lots of glass. So just obviously come in at your own uh, discretion. It looks like a war zone. So there was a separate room in the back, the red. You can see the delineation of the colors. And then the front part of the room was my bedroom. Glass, toys, pieces of furniture are everywhere. Her walls are bent. And Megan tells me this all happened in less than a minute. When Megan got home from work Wednesday, she decided to go ahead and put up her shutters. That's when she heard a noise she will never forget. It's a low drumming sound, and it, it does sound to an extent like a train. And then the pressure change, the only way I can describe it is you feel like you're in a vacuum. Your ears are popping, your ears are hurting. Born in Mississippi, Megan is no stranger to tornadoes. So she shoved her best friend, their four kids, and the dog into this small hallway bathroom just in time. As soon as we closed the door to the bathroom, it hit. And we actually thought we were okay because the bathroom itself was intact. And as everything is calming down, we look down, we see a bunch of glass. We're trying to figure out where it came from. And we opened the door and I looked up to what is supposed to be a hallway and there was sunlight. From floor to ceiling, nothing was spared. Even her hurricane proof windows blew out, but her family is safe. It's just stuff like, yeah, it sucks. And my kids are going to have a new normal and we're going to have a different place to live for a while. Just devastating to see, especially in the light, all the damage. It's been two weeks since Hurricane Helene made landfall and the intense flooding caused by the storm has left many people without power and water, leaving them unable to perform daily tasks like wash their clothes. However, a business called Dry Clean City is doing something about that. Staff has been driving around the Northeast Tennessee and Western North Carolina region, picking up people's unwashed laundry and returning it clean. The Western North Carolina still has no power, no water. So we have a, a service that has going up there, collecting the laundry from them, bringing it back to our facilities, washing it, cleaning it, drying it, folding it, and taking it back up there. I'm sure it was greatly appreciated. So far, the dry cleaning service has helped hundreds of people in the community, including first responders and small businesses. Ownership for Dry Clean City uh, says they will continue to help at all locations for as long as they can. New developments. Two federal judges have rejected requests to immediately reopen voter registration in Georgia and Florida as the Southeast reels from the devastation from these two major storms. The judges argued extending the deadline a week would further stress state election offices. Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, told reporters on Monday there was nothing inhibiting unregistered voters from registering before Monday's deadline as Milton hadn't hit yet. Kamala Harris is more likable than Donald Trump, but the former president has better leadership qualities, according to new Gallup polling. 
60% say Harris is likable to 38% who say the same of Trump. Harris ranks higher on strong moral character, honesty, trustworthiness, and caring about the needs of everyday people. 60% say Trump is a strong and decisive leader to 48% who say the same of Harris. He initially said he'd slap 100% tariffs on Mexican imports. Now, Donald Trump says it's closer to 200% if he wins in November. Trump made that pledge during a campaign stop in Wisconsin. Trump's running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, says tariffs are a key negotiation strategy. Well, I do think that it's negotiation. Donald Trump is a negotiator. He believes in using tariffs for negotiation, but he also does believe in using tariffs to induce more manufacturing, more capital formation in our country. Mexico exported about 3 million vehicles to the U.S. last year. Detroit's three automakers accounted for about half of those. Right now, it remains to be seen whether such restrictions on Mexico are even possible. A new report says the U.S. has spent a record amount of military aid to Israel. According to Brown University's Cost of War Project, the U.S. spent at least $17.9 billion on the aid since the war in Gaza started. Researchers also say the U.S. is spending an extra $4.86 billion for U.S. military operations in the region since last October 7th when Hamas attacked Israel. Happening now, TD Bank is pleading guilty and agreeing to pay $3 billion in penalties over federal money laundering charges. According to the Justice Department, the Canadian money lender failed to properly monitor its transactions, making it, quote, convenient for drug cartels and other criminals to move illegal funds. In all, the department says three money laundering networks were able to funnel $670 million through the bank over a six-year period. At least one of those schemes allegedly involved multiple bank employees. At various times, high-level executives, including the person who became the bank's chief anti-money laundering officer, knew there were serious problems with the bank's anti-money laundering program, but the bank failed to correct them. In addition to the fine, TD Bank also agrees to a three-year independent monitor as well as an asset cap on new deposits made in the U.S. We're getting a look at one of the last inflation reports before the election. Important data for voters who rank the economy as their top issue. National correspondent Atra Elnishar has a look at the latest numbers. A fresh read on inflation shows prices continue to stabilize, but what Americans are paying for necessities is still, for many, too high for comfort. The 12-month consumer inflation rate dropped slightly to 2.4 percent in September, thanks in large part to a drop in energy prices, but the cost of housing and food still higher than anyone wants to see. Members of the Federal Reserve watching all of this closely as they decide when and by how much to cut interest rates again. The overall trend over 12, 18 months is clearly that inflation has come down a lot. The hardest thing that the central bank has to do is to try to get the timing right when, there, when there's these moments of transition. The Fed also cautious of what's going on with the job market. New weekly jobless claims Thursday came in at 258,000, higher than expected, though experts say that's likely a reflection of the effects of Hurricane Helene. On the campaign trail, both presidential candidates zeroing in on the issue. The only way to end this suffering is to vote for change this November. Former President Trump trying to capitalize on the sentiment behind polls like this one from CNN, showing 50 percent of likely voters have more confidence in Trump to handle the economy compared to 39 percent who trust Vice President Harris. Foreign leaders and CEOs call me up to complain about our tariffs. My answer will be very simple. Build it in America. You don't have any tariffs. Harris emphasizes data showing the economy is strong and points to warnings about her opponent's plans if he wins. My econ policies, Goldman Sachs to 16 Nobel laureates will tell you that my plans will strengthen our economy. Donald Trump's plans would weaken our economy, would inflate inflation and would bring a recession on by the middle of next year. More economic data is on the way. We'll get fresh reads on inflation, jobs, and wages over the five days leading up to Election Day on November 5th. 
In Washington, I'm Atrel Nashar for the National News Desk, America's News Now. Social Security recipients will see their monthly payments inch up by only 2.5% next year. The steady decline in inflation limits the annual cost of living adjustment, according to the Social Security Administration. Big picture, for nearly 68 million retirees, monthly payments will go up by about $50 to a little under $2,000 beginning in January. The new payments will feel like a small adjustment compared to the 8.7% adjustment in 2023. The Supreme Court signaled it may uphold a Biden administration regulation on ghost gun kits, which allow people to build fully functional and untraceable guns at home. Justice Samuel Alito questioned the administration on whether a collection of unassembled parts can be considered a gun. But Chief Justice John Roberts appeared skeptical of the notion that the two the kits are geared towards hobbyists. The Biden administration has claimed ghost guns are being used more frequently by criminals. The high court's decision is expected by next summer. After sitting in a Brooklyn jail for almost a month, Sean Diddy Combs just made his first appearance before the judge, who is set to preside over his trial. Emma Withrow, joining us now from the Fact Check team, Diddy is facing multiple charges. We know this. You dug deeper into the details of those allegations. Let's start with that. Yeah, so I'll break them down into layman's terms, aside from all the legal jargon. So Sean Combs is being charged with racketeering conspiracy, which means he's accused of running a criminal group that basically was doing a bunch of illegal stuff, sex trafficking by force fraud, or coercion, meaning he allegedly forced and manipulated women or men into sex work through lies and violence, and then transportation for purposes of prostitution. So they're accusing him of essentially moving people across state lines for prostitution. And I want to talk about the, the recent video that that came out. Yeah. Sean Combs's lawyers have accused federal authorities of leaking evidence after news agencies got a hold of that video yeah. of Combs beating his former girlfriend in a hotel hallway. Uh, they're now demanding an investigation into this do they have any proof that the feds leaked this video so I went through the copy of the memo that they filed about this his lawyers filed um, they didn't have any direct evidence that Homeland Security officials had leaked the tape but they did provide examples of why they think it seems like DHS did this as far as DHS goes they haven't come out and um, said anything about this yet but I'm sure we'll hear from uh, DHS soon yeah, as it, this continues to be investigated. Emma, thank yeah. you. Later on, Emma will be back to break down how much time Combs could face if convicted. Honda is recalling nearly 2 million vehicles over steering issues. According to the National Highway Transportation Administration, the steering gearbox was improperly produced, causing a sticky feeling. The recall affects 1.7 million Hondas and Acuras made from 2022 to 2025. Some models include, as you see here, the list, the Honda Civic, Honda CRV, Acura Integra, and Acura Integra Type S. Up next on the National News Desk, America's News. Now, picking up the pieces. What is next for parts of Florida's West Coast now recovering from Hurricane Milton? Milton hit the Florida coastline Wednesday night as a Category 3 hurricane devastating multiple communities due to high winds and flooding. Earlier this week, I spoke with Costa Sardellis from Tidewater Disaster Response about the ongoing relief efforts. The death toll is rising. Millions are still in the dark in Florida. You are helping people on the ground. What are you seeing and hearing, experiencing at this time? Good evening. Thanks for having me. So it's been a dynamic last 12 hours. We headed out this morning around 3 a.m. after the waters and the winds started to die down. The storm started to pass through and it's you know, it's a, it's a dynamic situation for sure. There was some decent flooding. There was a lot of flash flooding, a lot of storm surge that we saw as we were out riding around getting situational assessments. Um, but what we were hearing this morning, especially as the sun started to come up, you know, we heard this time and time again throughout Clearwater. And even when we were down in Sarasota later in the morning is this wasn't as bad as it could have been. And I heard that from firefighters. I heard that from sheriff's deputies. I heard that from some of the Florida DOT guys. So while the impacts were really astounding and something to see once the sun came up, it the people of Florida are very resilient and a lot of folks that were natives and locals to this area were 
thankful that it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Some silver lining there, but we know just days ago, remember, we spoke after Hurricane Helene yep. left a devastating impact on communities. They're still drying out. So you were in the thick of all of that. You were making supply drops. I remember uh, you spoke to this a little bit, but how does Milton compare? To be frank, they're they're all different, right? It's each hurricane, each region throughout the U.S. They they all present these own, these unique and dynamic challenges. They all present the hazards that come with a hurricane differently. And I think you know the biggest thing about Florida is the types of plants, the types of trees. There's just so many trees down, and there's so many power lines down, right? And it's it's something that's really difficult to navigate, especially in the dark this morning when we were getting out and about, you know, going five, 10 miles an hour drives that should have taken 15 minutes were taking us 45 minutes to get around. And that's why they keep harping on us. I'm sure you guys have heard in the news all day today is, you know, staying off the roads and letting letting Florida DOT, letting Duke Energy get out and actually do an assessment, letting the sheriff's department get out and do their assessments because the amount of trees down and the amount of power lines down is just, it's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it was striking to see. And what really stood out to me were those the piles of debris acting as projectiles and the whipping wind and the flash flooding. Um, as we move forward, Costa, what steps can we expect in terms of recovery as more first responders head to the southeast coast after now two major hurricanes? Well, like I said, the biggest thing is getting the roads open and getting power mm -hmm. restored. And if there's one thing Florida's good at, they are really good at opening up roads and getting power turned back on. Duke Energy's got, I believe, in the tens of thousands of linemen staged throughout the states. Um, and Florida DOT, you know, their cut and toss program, they get their rubber tire loaders out before the sun even comes up to start opening roads. So that's step one, obviously, you know, they're encouraging people, give them time so that they can get the roads open, make sure everything's safe with all these down power lines. You don't know what lines are live, what lines are cut off. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to be careful with all that. And then it's, you know, back to clean up, back to mucking out houses, which that's the long term effort. It's not a it's not a quick process, despite how good we can be. There's a lot of great organizations out there that support with that crisis cleanup team Rubicon to name a few. Um, and then you'll have folks like Operation Barbecue moving in later in the week to help provide food for people that don't have kitchens to cook in. They even provide food for folks in shelters. So that's just what the next 72 hours to five days look like. And then after that, it's time to rebuild and, you know, get Florida back to the beautiful place that it's always been. Yeah, I can't imagine um, what you are going through now, uh, wait, what the like people uh, in the community are going through as rescues are still ongoing. So we cannot thank you enough for your time, Costa Sardellis. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Hospitals are running low on IVs after Hurricane Helene damaged one of the country's largest production facilities. The National News Desk, Jeff Harris, explains. Federal health officials have approved the import of certain IV fluids from overseas, so some help is on the way right now. But in the meantime, I'm told U.S. hospitals are starting to ration supplies. Joshua Denson, an intensive care physician at East Jefferson General Hospital with Tulane University, tells us he's experiencing this IV fluid shortage firsthand. It's being felt definitely throughout the hospital, and it definitely is on the back of everybody's minds. Denson says his department has to use IVs, but in other departments, it's being communicated to try and ration resources. When there's a 50-50 call, if you need to use some IV fluids to maybe not use those in certain circumstances. Arjun Venkatesh, a professor of emergency medicine at Yale, tells us this shortage is a lot more widespread than many think. It's affecting saline and fluids for dialysis and nutrition. Many people get uh, nutrition via an IV if they've got a cancer of the mouth or for some reason have uh, to be fed via an IV because they can't swallow food. Like most hospitals and emergency departments across the country, Venkatesh says they're taking proactive steps to try and conserve as much IV fluid as possible. Encouraging people to drink fluids orally instead of intravenous, things like that are already starting to work. Is it going to be enough to weather the whole storm? I think that remains to be seen. A question Denson also once answered, but for the time being, outside of the ICU, they're doing everything they can to get by. We don't have much luxury to withhold certain things and wait and see. Um, but other places in the hospital, we do, and we're doing that. Now, after a brief pause, Baxter did resume distribution of supplies, but with a significant restriction on the amount that can be ordered. Right now, they're at about 60% of typical order volume. I'm Jeff Harris reporting from Washington. Up next, your Election Day attack foiled. The Afghan national facing charges for his alleged 
polling place plot in the state of Oklahoma. Plus, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the charity that's asking for help to aid survivors in their recovery. The National News Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, and we begin in North Carolina, where two brothers tell their story of survival while sitting on a pile of debris that was once their home. By noon, we just barely escaped the house and uh, watched the house float away in a complete unit, the whole entire upstairs kind of surreal. But that was just the beginning. I was stuck in my car between floodwaters and windstorm debris flying through the air. So we just kind of huddled in the car, me and my two border collies, and just waiting to see if, if we were going to see the next day or not. Minutes turned into hours. I didn't lose hope, but I knew there was a good chance I might not make it out. Half a day passed. Water just came up and touched the back of the car, and then it finally started to recede. His engine didn't flood, so on three wheels, literally, Keister and his two dogs, Willens and Biza, made it to the nearest fire department. So if I didn't have my brother and I didn't have family and friends in my community supporting me, or if I lost my dogs, I would be a total wreck. It's great to see the support. Less than a month before the presidential election, the FBI arrested 27-year-old Nasir Tahiti this week in Oklahoma. The Afghan national allegedly told investigators he was planning an attack on election day on behalf of ISIS. Governor Kevin Stitt says he believes the attack would have taken place in the state. It was a polling place in America, and we're assuming that since they were in Oklahoma here and bought the weapons, it was, it was, uh, they were planning something in Oklahoma. Governor Stitt says there may be some increased security measures on Election Day, but he is confident the people of Oklahoma will be safe. A national nonprofit dedicated to getting free breast prostheses to breast cancer survivors says they need more help to help more women. Knitted Knockers partners with medical centers across the nation to provide handmade knitted breast prosthetics, supplying over 12,000 free pairs a month. It is a life-changing alternative for many women. The knocker comes in if there is an extended period of time between um, the first surgery or where the breast is removed and where we can actually get a permanent prosthesis. Um, or sometimes patients don't want to go through an additional surgery. The organization is asking for more knitters or crocheters so they can continue to help as many people as possible. Baby boomers are living longer than previous generations, but they're more likely to have worse health. New research published in the Journals of Gerontology looked at health data collected from more than 100,000 people. The data show that baby boomers are more likely to have chronic health conditions like diabetes, high cholesterol, and heart problems than previous generations at the same age. The study authors said the results were generally similar for men and women. The Nobel Committee awarded professors John Hopfield and Jeffrey Hinton the 2024 Nobel Prize in Physics this week for their work on artificial intelligence. They were praised for their foundational discoveries that enable machine learning with artificial neural networks. The chair of the Nobel Committee for Physics says their work allowed AI to become part of our daily lives. Hayden says while it may have a huge influence on our lives, there is a threat of getting out of control without proper regulation. Ahead in our next half hour, antitrust allegations. The lawsuit claiming Amazon is inflating prices and stifling new competition. Plus Fisher Price recalling a baby product linked to the death of five infants. The company's directive for parents and why some say it doesn't go far enough. You're watching the National News Desk, America's News. Now, you can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. You're watching.
watching the National News Desk, America's News Now. Helene and Milton igniting a political storm. Both Trump and Harris fading, facing backlash related to disaster relief. Plus voting changes, North Carolina election officials okay new rules to help residents hit hard by Hurricane Helene. And later, gender gap, both candidates seeking the attention of younger voters. How the group's political divide could shape this year's election. From the nation's capital, this is the National News Desk, America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton. Thanks for being here with us. Right now, millions of people are beginning the long road to recovery from Helene and Milton. It's only been a few days, but Trump and Harris are already clashing over relief efforts. Here's national correspondent Kayla Gaskins. Hurricanes Milton and Helene igniting a political storm between Donald Trump, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. The federal government, on the other hand, has has not done what you're supposed to be doing, in particular with respect to North Carolina. They've let those people uh, suffer unjustly. Despite the misinformation and lies, the truth is we're providing the resources needed to rescue, recover, and rebuild. Donald Trump attempting to turn the disaster response into campaign ammunition, repeatedly claiming FEMA funds are being diverted away from helping hurricane survivors and funneled towards helping illegal migrants. They had no money. You know where they gave the money? To illegal immigrants coming in. Biden and Harris firing back. It is dangerous. It is, it is unconscionable, frankly, that anyone who would consider themselves a leader would mislead desperate people. Mr. President Trump, former President Trump, get a life, man. Help these people. FEMA does have a program to help illegal migrants, which has its own budget separate from disaster relief. The agency says no money has been diverted from one bucket to the other. We spoke with Caitlin Durkovich, the Biden administration's senior director for resilience and recovery. The president has made it very clear to his team here and to his administration that we don't play politics when it comes to disaster response. Meanwhile, there's a spotlight on Vice President Kamala Harris's leadership skills as she attempts to showcase herself as a compassionate, competent leader. Harris receiving criticism for attending swanky fundraisers after Helene made landfall and doing lighthearted interviews as Milton barreled towards Florida. <laughs> Voters in states impacted by Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton are now asking the courts to extend voter registration deadlines in light of the natural disasters. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting for the National News Desk, America's News Now. More than 500 bridges in western North Carolina were damaged by Hurricane Helene two weeks ago. The state's transportation secretary said more than 100 bridges will need to be fully replaced. Due to the extreme damage, areas in 10 counties are only accessible by all-terrain vehicles, footbridges, and National Guard vehicles. Repairs to Interstate 40 are expected to be finished by early next year. The highway was damaged by a landslide and part of it collapsed near the Tennessee state line. Eastbound lanes have already reopened. In hard-hit Asheville, North Carolina, local election officials are vowing to make sure all residents have a way to vote in the upcoming election. All of our staff and board members are accounted for, and despite personal hardship, we've been organizing to make sure this community has a voice in choosing the people that represent us both in good times and in tragedy. In addition to that pledge, state election officials approved an emergency resolution today modifying voting rules. The changes would allow outreach teams in 13 counties to help people complete their ballots. Residents would also be allowed to pick up absentee ballots and return them to any polling place on November 5th. Pennsylvania election officials will be able to notify voters of mistakes in their mail-in ballots and let them make changes. That was the ruling from the state's top court. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court declined to hear the Republican National Committee's lawsuit, saying it filed the case too close to the election. The case is one of more than 120 voting-related lawsuits the RNC is involved with across 26 states. Women could decide the presidential election. And one big reason, women are outvoting men. Joining Angela Brown to discuss is Trump economic advisor, Steve Moore. 
And let's talk about this recent Gallup poll. It's getting a lot of mm -hmm. play, a lot of attention, and it found that women are becoming more liberal politically. I want you to take a look, our viewers at home, at some of these numbers that we found here. Um, it said that uh, women around 9 and 10 at this point uh, say that their views, they said 87 percent, we're talking about women between the ages mm -hmm. of 18 and 29, 87 percent said their views are closer to liberal than conservatives. Yeah. Now, I went on X and I saw your post on X and you said, that's bad news, Steve. Why did you say that? Well, what you're seeing, Angela, maybe you may better have explanation than I do, because you're a woman and I'm not, but sure. you're seeing a divide among how young men are voting and young women are voting. So young men are much more likely to self-identify as moving more towards the conservative, and whereas younger women are uh, moving pretty decisively in a more liberal direction, and they, they self-identify as, as liberal. In, in other words, young women 20 years ago used to self-identify as moderate politically, and now they've moved more in the liberal direction. And for Republicans, that's a big problem because they've got to win, you know, a, a pretty good percentage of the of the female vote or Kamala Harris will win the election. So if Kamala Harris does win, it'll probably be because she, her message really has appealed to younger women. And what Yallop showed was that this has been a trend that's happening for about the last 25 years. You know what's interesting is when you look at the ages here, it was um, 18 to 29, and the issues that really stuck out for these female voters, it was things like uh, climate change, it was, of mm -hmm. course, um, ab abortion access, God, and God things issues. along those lines. Yes, that yeah. um, some feel that Democrats or, or, or liberals are more in line with. So what can Republicans do? What economic issues can they tap into to try to appeal to that voter base, those yeah. 18 to 29 year old women who may be concerned about climate change or climate issues. Well, this is why I, I wrote my book with Arthur Laffer about the Trump economic mm -hmm. miracle, because if Trump is going to win this election, it's really going to have to be on the, what I call, Angela, the kitchen table issues. Mm -hmm. Can you pay your bills? You know, gas prices, you were just talking about the gas shortages and in, uh, in Florida, uh, the issues about whether I can afford to have a, a children and, and whether I can take a vacation, those kinds of things. So I think that's what the Trump campaign is gonna have to do in these final weeks is convince women, well, maybe you don't agree with me on all the social issues, but on those issues that affect your wallet, those are where you need to vote for Trump. So uh, inflation, um, doubling down on issues that impact <laughs> there people, you go. what they do every day, like go to the grocery store. Yeah, and unfortunately, we're starting to see a tick up of inflation again. You know, we had brought inflation down from 9% down to about 3%, but the latest indicators the last couple of weeks are that those prices are starting to edge up again. So it'll really be a question of whether those uh, kitchen table, um, you know, uh, financial issues are the most important thing for people. and. For me, they are, but everybody has different opinions. You're right. And, you know, and one thing people are always concerned about are jobs. People want to work. Yeah, and I tell you one thing. That's true, too. Yeah. The Biden administration kind of taking a, a mini victory lap over the jobs numbers. You see them right here, 254,000 jobs in September. But when you look at the numbers, you said there's a little red flag here, and that's that 785,000 mm -hmm. we see in government jobs. Once again, people love to work, but you say that could be a little bit problematic. Why do you think that, Steve? Well, we, we've seen in the last year, and Angela, you and I have talked about this in recent weeks, that more and more of the jobs that have been created have been in the uh, two sectors of the economy. One is healthcare, which is the biggest employer, and the second has been government. And, you know, at a time when the national uh, federal debt, debt is now up by $2 trillion over the last year, $2 trillion, yeah. uh, we should be actually downsizing government employment right now now of course we need some more people for fema you know, to make sure we can get the aid to people <laughs> yeah. but the, so many of these agencies have grown 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 and what i'm saying is we're creating jobs yeah but they're not in the sectors of the economy that we most want we want to be building things in manufacturing construction business services uh you know retail wholesale unfortunately that's not where the jobs are all right thank you so much steve trump economic advisor steve moore thank you as always thank for joining you. us. see you angela bye the Federal Trade Commission can continue with its antitrust lawsuit against Amazon after a federal judge's ruling. The FTC and other states claim that Amazon inflates prices and hinders market competition. The judge dismissed claims by New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, and Maryland. The states allege that consumers only consider popular websites like Amazon and Walmart 
when shopping for household products. The trial is set to start in October 2026. Panera Bread settled a lawsuit with the family of a woman with a heart condition who died after drinking its charged lemonade. Sarah Katz, an Ivy League student, had long QT syndrome type 1, a congenital heart condition. Her roommates testified that she went into cardiac arrest a few hours after having the lemonade. Panera discounted the drink in May after or discontinued, I should say, the drink in May after three other lawsuits alleging health complications. Settlement details have not been released. New American Heart Association research finds that keeping your brain sharp as you age has a lot to do with your heart. The AHA says that treating heart risk factors early may help reduce the burden of Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias, and it estimates nearly 130 million adults in the United States have some form of heart disease. According to the World Health Organization, coronary heart disease, the buildup of plaque in the arteries, is the world's leading killer. Children's toy maker Fisher Price is recalling nearly 2 million infant swings after reported deaths from the product's use. The recalled Snuggo swings, they were sold at Amazon, Walmart, and Target nationwide. The $160 swing prevent, presents, according to officials, a suffocation hazard, which has led to five deaths between 2012 and 2022. Customers who own the swing are instructed to remove the headrest by cutting it off. The company says it will provide a $25 refund for those who remove and destroy the attachment. Still to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from inflation to immigration, the top issues for voters ahead of the election. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day, and our team of correspondents reports on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. Hurricanes Helene and Milton causing significant damage in the southeast this past week, and they were also turned into a political football on the campaign trail. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, tell us about that. Yeah, see, both sides using this disaster and the fallout from it and the federal response to it and comments made about it as ways to lob criticisms at each other. Oh, so we'll start with Donald Trump. He's made these comments multiple times on the campaign trail. He's accusing FEMA of diverting funds away from disaster relief towards housing illegal migrants. Now, FEMA has come out and said that is absolutely not the case. While they do have a program to help uh, migrants that are here illegally, these are two completely separate buckets of money, and they're not diverting one towards the other. President Biden has come out and called up uh, President Trump's comments on American, that they're lies, highly critical of him. Now, Kamala Harris is in the spotlight as well, because this is a chance where the country is getting to see her on a big stage and just how she conducts herself, how she can lead the country through this. And she's getting criticism as well for going to swanky fundraisers while the hurricanes were heading towards Florida or sitting down and, and doing what some are calling softball interviews with outlets like The View uh, or Stephen Colbert or certain podcasts while the hurricane cleanup is happening as well. It's unclear if this is going to have any impact on the election, these hurricanes and the fallout from it and the federal response. Um, but we'll keep an eye on that as the election gets closer and closer. Yeah, just a few weeks away. Meanwhile, one of the last inflation reports ahead of Election Day released Thursday with Kamala Harris's campaign, hoping the drop in the inflation rate gives her a boost. National correspondent Atra Elnishar, how is voters' top issue, the economy, playing out in the final weeks of the presidential campaign? Yeah, Steve, we always watched data like the consumer inflation report closely, but now we're watching it hyper vigilantly because the economy, like you said, is voters' top issue. So this week we learned consumer inflation fell slightly to 2.4 percent uh, year over year. And there were also some weekly jobless claims that that are worth a second look, uh, 254,000 for the week. However, experts believe that was largely a reflection of the devastation of Hurricane Helene. Hurricane Milton likely will have a similar effect on weekly jobless claims uh, next week. So what does this mean for voters? Well, 
inflation's falling, but prices are still high. We saw, we're seeing inflation drop uh, largely because of falling energy prices. They're noticing that, especially at the gas pump, which is great. Uh, we're not seeing that being disrupted really from the hurricanes, at least not yet. Uh, and this is also playing out on the campaign trail. Uh, we're seeing former President Trump try and capitalize on polls that show that voters trust him more than Vice President Harris on the economy. While Vice President Harris is pointing to data showing that the economy remains strong uh, and is echoing warnings about uh, some of Trump's economic policies, like uh, imposing widespread tariffs, for example. Uh, but we're going to get plenty more uh, economic reports before voting ends. Of course, early voting's already started, so uh, for some people, it's all said and done. They're looking at the, the data we already have, but we'll be getting fresh reads, uh, not just on inflation, but also jobs and wages over the five days before Election Day on November 5th. And another top issue with voters, immigration, was the reason for Donald Trump's visit to Colorado Friday, a state which is solidly in the Democrats' column. National correspondent Christine Frazal, why was Trump there and what was his message to voters? Yeah, Steve, this isn't the typical swing state campaign stop. This is for one purpose, to highlight an issue Donald Trump wants the world to think is widespread, and that is migrant crime. There is evidence uh, that some members of a Venezuelan gang called Train de Aragua uh, are operating inside the United States. And there is this viral video of people said to be members of this gang taking over an, apart over an apartment complex in Aurora, Colorado, a smaller city outside of Denver, which, as we know, has gotten quite a big influx of migrants over the last few years. Uh, Train de Aragua is a violent gang, which multiple experts I've spoken to have said is worse than MS-13. Gang members have been arrested there. They've been arrested throughout Texas. And Trump will continue to hammer home this idea uh, that migrants, the you know, so many of whom have come in under the Biden-Harris administration, are making our country less safe. Kamala Harris has slammed Trump for his divisive language. Uh, she says this is purely political, that if Donald Trump actually wanted to do something, Thing. Well, he had the chance, and instead of backing a bipartisan bill in Congress, he told Republicans not to even let it come up for a vote. Uh, still, you know, if Kamala Harris loses, uh, a lot of people think that the reason will be because of immigration. Yeah, immigration, the economy, disaster relief, three possible potential issues that voters will be uh, will voting on the next few weeks, and it could have an impact on the presidential race, which is neck and neck at this point. Christine, Atra, Kayla, thank you all for your hard work and great reporting. Back to you. Sean Diddy Combs just made an appearance in federal court in New York after pleading not guilty to a long list of charges ranging from sex trafficking to racketeering. Emma Withrow joins us from the Fact Check team. Combs faces potentially a decade or even life in prison if convicted of these charges, correct? Yeah, he does. It could be a long time and it's all going to depend on how this trial turns out. So for the racketeering conspiracy charge, the maximum penalty is life in prison. But in 2022, people convicted of RICO crimes served an average of around 10 years years in jail, so it's going to depend on that. For the sex trafficking charge, the Department of Justice says the average sentence ranges from 15 to 30 years, but there's a mandatory 15-year minimum sentence that's set by federal law for victims who are 14 and under, so it could be a lot more based on the number of victims. We're just going to have to wait and see. And then for the transportation for prostitution charge, sentences do range from 5 to 10 years, but it really does depend on the circumstance for that one. So 10 years is the statutory maximum under the federal law, so we'll have to see what comes out in the case. And we know Combs was denied bail, and that's after several attempts. Is it common yeah. for someone charged with these types of crimes to be denied bail? From my research, it does sound like it is pretty common. Um, according to the Bail Reform Act, bail may be generally denied if a defendant is determined to be a flight risk or a danger to the community. And prosecutors for Combs' case did argue that he was a flight risk. Experts say in cases where the defendant could be facing as much as a life sentence, it's pretty common for them to be denied bail, even if they do have the money to post it. Emma, thank you. And we yeah. know there's a lot of research on this. If you want to take another look at this fact check team topic, including links to the sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit our website, thenationaldesk.com. Up next, shots fired on Sunday morning. The safety team member who protected a Texas church from two dangerous suspects. Plus, a change in temperature ushering in a slew of sinus issues. How to spot the difference between fall allergies and the common cold.
The national news desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America and we start in Austin, Texas, where church volunteers may have stopped a mass shooting by firing shots of their own. How concerning or how shocking is it to hear about what happened this morning at the church up here? I don't know about fear. I mean, it's very concerning. You know, it was just outside my neighborhood. The Vernon County Sheriff's Office says deputies responded to Epicenter Church on North U.S. Highway 281 this morning for a welfare check. When they arrived, they say they learned shots have been fired at the church by a member of the volunteer safety team. According to the Sheriff's Office, the safety team member said he confronted two suspicious male suspects, one with a rifle, outside the church. The safety team member fired multiple rounds, causing the suspects to flee. Rodriguez says that volunteer is a hero. I mean, what would have happened if uh, the security guard wasn't there? It could have been bad for everybody in the church. The big one that you probably hear a lot about is ragweed, and that's the that's the predominant one. But there are a lot of other. Uh, weed allergies and weed plants that pollinate at this time of year. Dr. Avi Darrow explained when gardens die and rot during this season, mold spores can form to cause allergies as well. This contributes to your itchy eyes or even runny nose and many other symptoms from allergies. Not all runny noses are allergies. People with allergies have probably had these same symptoms last year and will notice that they will come on gradually and linger for days or weeks. Any kind of sudden onset of fever with body aches, chills, fatigue, uh, along with those respiratory symptoms of stuffy nose, coughing, sneezing. And that's, that's probably more typical of a viral illness. It's a very true statement having been there at Katrina that this is the Katrina of the mountains. So Mercy Chefs brought the kitchen sink and then some. I think that this is probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life, to be honest. It makes every three hours sleep worth it. And it hasn't stopped since October 1st. We're here in the dark, we come back in the dark, and um, it's all worth it when we see somebody open that box and a tear run down their eye. Even though the chefs travel with the organization, even more help comes from volunteers. We started with just one or two, and now we're here at 80 a day. When you're seeing this and you're seeing the massive scale of this disaster, you're also seeing people in the middle of it all helping their neighbor. Coming up, French fry oversupply, high prices pushing consumers away from fast food, how the trend is impacting the nation's largest supplier when we get back. Diners are cutting back on fast food due to high prices, and it's burning the country's largest French fry supplier. Lamb Weston says it's closing a Washington state plant, laying off 400 workers due to slowing demand. To lure customers back, some chains are pushing value meals, but that isn't helping Lamb Weston because the portion of French fries is smaller. People are also unlikely to cook the food at home. New details, the NCAA is a step closer to allowing schools to pay athletes directly. This week, a judge granted preliminary approval to a $2.8 billion settlement for current and former athletes. Part of that would be a $21 million pool to share revenue with athletes. If finalized, it resolves three major antitrust lawsuits against the association. A final hearing is set for April 2025. Mega Millions will now cost $5 per ticket starting in April 2025, doubling from the current $2 ticket price. Lottery officials say the price increase will lead to bigger prizes, larger payouts, and more winners. Powerball, normally found alongside Mega Millions, says it has no plans to change its prices. More official changes will be announced in the coming months. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National News Desk, America's News. Now, don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of the National News Desk. I'm Didi Gatton, and from all of us here, have a great week.